recording and let you take it away, Jesse. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I am extremely excited to be able to talk to you guys about some, some of the work that I do, some of the work that I love that I've been experimenting for the past few years on. So I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of background of how I came to grow in the way that I do, uh, a little bit of more understanding of ecology, and then some understanding of the conventional framework of growing right now, and then more nitty gritty on my own personal process. So uh, when I started getting into mycology, oh, having trouble with the controls here. When I started getting into mycology, it was kind of a need-based uh, endeavor. I felt like uh, I was heading down a path that wasn't too sustainable for myself. Uh, I was a big adrenaline junkie, and this is by no means the most gruesome of the pictures of my eight concussions. And I decided that I wanted to be a little less intense with my body, a little bit more conscious. And so part of that was picking different activities to uh, enjoy my time <laughs> with. And part of that was learning more about, uh, oh, not sure why this isn't working here. Now it's gone. All right. The start of that was getting really excited about growing my own food, learning a little bit about soil biology and just natural systems and natural phenomena. And so the first person that really got me excited about uh, cultivation, cultivation of mushrooms and their nutritional medicinal benefits was Paul Stamets. And I was very privileged, fortunate to be able to go out and uh, take some classes with him, spend some time at his farm. And there are some things that I appreciate deeply about the work that he's done in terms of uh, how meticulous he takes notes and the nuances of his uh, ecological uh, understanding of each species that he grows. And that has helped me greatly in order to kind of build off of that because a lot of how I grow now is uh, abundantly informed from ecology. And then next I was able to go uh, spend some time with Trad Cotter of Mushroom Mountain, another extremely important mentor in my learning. Trad uh, also pays a lot of attention to ecology, but something that was interesting to me was he was attempting to uh, put a lot more reusable containers into his production system. And the single-use plastic bags that are so common in mushroom cultivation um, just have never really felt uh, that ethical to me to be using one plastic bag for every pound of mushrooms. So that was something that was super attractive. And so I spent some time learning from Trad. And then taking it a uh, step in a little bit of a different direction, I went to British Columbia to spend some time with Brian Callow of But the Fungus, an absolutely wonderful name <laughs> and a wonderful farm. And Brian grows outdoors, all of his production system is in greenhouses, they're shelter logic greenhouses with shade cloth on top on a concrete slab. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and that kind of diversified my understanding of how these organisms could be cultivated and also uh, produced with high quality and on a regular schedule. And so I got uh, really inspired by all of this work, but I was still in college. I was going to college at Sterling in upstate Vermont. And so there was pretty much no way that I was going to not grow. <laughs> and so I did whatever I could. I had salvaged some pieces of PVC. I bought a couple fittings new, but, and then bought some plastic and built a little indoor grow system. And my intention was, besides the plastic that I used initially, was to use no fossil fuels or single use plastic in that system. And so I, in terms of uh, humidity retention and airflow. I just poked a bunch of holes on the top, which you can't see. And then I raised the whole little structure about three or four inches. And knowing that carbon dioxide is a heavier gas than oxygen, it provided enough uh, airflow pulling the oxygen from the top of the greenhouse and pushing out the CO2 from the bottom where there was a few inch gap. And so that worked enough with any container I could find. I gleaned them from the um, kitchen and then sold all the mushrooms that I grew back to the kitchen, which at uh, a certain point in the semester when I had enough time was about 10 pounds a week roughly. 
could have been more if I emptied the buckets and uh, shuffled them at a different pace, but that was a little bit more work for, a little too much work for my schedule at the time. And I incubated them with pieces of tape over the holes and <laughs> basically used any friend's room and overstepped my boundaries many different places in order to make my passion come alive. And thank you to all of those friends that helped me out at that early stage. And it worked out surprisingly well. They were a little bleach white, um, but they still produced quite successfully. And so one other individual that I want to mention from Sterling College that was extremely influential in my learning was Dr. Laura Spence. And in terms of ecology and uh, having all your growing informed by ecology there's not a single person in my life that's been more influential um, she's got her doctorate in uh, ecology with a focus on arbuscular mycorrhiza which is another huge area of interest for me and uh, her ability to communicate to her students to me uh, how to pick apart an academic paper um, and how to really critical think about different experiments and, and checking your assumptions was very influential to how I'm doing what I'm doing right now. And the last person I'll mention, the, the single most influential mentor for my current growing style is Glenn Coville of Wild Branch Farms, also in Craftsbury Common, Vermont. And uh, when I stepped on his farm, I had my mind blown so many times in the first hour that I was there that it was just absolutely astounding how many uh, status quos he was breaking, how many things that I thought were requirements for cultivation were totally not part of his system. And so this is a picture of him using little wire extension um, caterpillar tunnels with a shade cloth, and that's what he would use to grow his turkey tails, oysters, and lion's mane. We'll talk a little bit more about his system later. And this is a uh, fungal forest farm, which is a manifestation of all those learnings. And this is really what I care about. I care about the planet. Um, understanding the gravity of the crisis that we are in, the environmental crisis that we're in is really difficult to absorb, um, but it's something that I think is important to sit with and important to not only sit with the pain, but also dwell on the possibility because there are so many different solutions. And I think just through working together, it's totally possible for us to take on this problem. So uh, what are fungi? I'm gonna go through this rather quickly because I assume many of you know, um, fungi are a kingdom of their own. They produce uh, exudates or enzymes that can digest their food externally and they secrete that into their environment and then grow into it and then reabsorb the nutrients into their cells. And as many people know, all mushrooms are fungi, not all fungi are mushrooms. Mushrooms are a reproductive structure that produces spores, often carried by animals or wind or rain. And then once they find a suitable habitat, and they then form hyphae, which collectively form mycelium, which is what the visible network of filaments are, and then when they are reached, when they reach a point of either being in danger of uh, being disturbed or they do not have enough food to eat or there's a seasonal change, they will often pr uh, produce a fruit body. And uh, this is a short video of just what the mycelium looks like. It's really interesting to observe just because, again, it can inform how you can, uh, it can inform the vigor of a strain. I like to use a lot of wild strains that are local so they can understand the climate that they're in. And so observing from the micro scale to the macro, I think is very helpful. And so as far as their ecological roles, I know we already mentioned these. The main three are pathogens. Um, having some trouble here with the controls. 
Not sure if I have to manually. Uh, maybe I can try to restart this presentation. All right, here we are. Symbionts, uh, which collectively form a very varied group, um, but this also can play into different forms of commercial production, which I'll speak about later, um, because many of the ectomycorrhizal species have high culinary value and, and an enormous market that can be tapped into. Um, and they form these filaments that attach to the roots. And in the case of ectomycorrhiza, they form a sheath around the roots, which is a site for exchange. And that uh, they, the fungus then goes and mines different nutrients and water, and then brings it back in exchange for photosynthates that the plant makes. And decomposers is the third group. And that's mainly what we'll be focusing on. And just to give you a little bit of context with what uh, Steve was mentioning in terms of nutritional and medicinal benefits, um, I don't think this is too abstract for this talk because this is largely related to marketing. So this is just a really quick uh, composition of a dried oyster mushroom that I got from a study online. And it can show that it's uh, the two main things that I would like to point out are the protein content, which is over 20% dry weight, and then the fiber content, which is pretty uh, significant. And fiber is very helpful to your gut microbiome um, and provides health in many different ways, which I won't go into right now. Another thing to mention is not only are they high in protein, it's diverse amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein. And I've seen studies showing uh, some oysters not containing all essential amino acids, but in this study I did see that they contain all amino acid, essential amino acids, making them a complete protein. As well as having uh, rad radical scavenging effects. Um, in other words, they are an antioxidant. And uh, in some more recent research, they have found um, ergothenine to be a particularly interesting compound. And interesting because it is not only antioxidant and inflammatory, but it has huge effects on uh, mild cognitive impairment or precursors to dementia. A study published in 2017 in Singapore found that seniors who consume more than two standard portions of mushrooms weekly may have 50% reduced odds of having mild cognitive impairment, which is extremely significant for just changing a small part of your diet. And so we're going to just briefly talk about the whole process in the framework of more conventional mushroom farming. I took this uh, little square from Steve's first presentation a few months ago um, just to explain each segment, but know that you don't have to start from culture library. You could be starting from the next few points down here, depending on what your space is. It's all about the context of your visions, values, and resources. And so starting a culture library or starting a farm in general it requires you to have a strain. Often this is not collected from the wild. You go to some type of uh, commercial strain seller and uh, you'd get it often in a vial for longer term storage. And these have been bred heavily for high yields and often have been grown for a long time in super sterile environments, which can be beneficial if you're always going to be growing in sterile environments. But as we'll see later, that's not always a requirement. Uh, then you sterilize mushroom food on more commercial scales. These are very large, can be 30 foot feet long autoclaves, and they heat them up to hundreds of degrees and over 15 pounds per square inch for a prolonged period of time. In the case of what the fungus in British Columbia, they use what's called hyper pasteurization, even though it essentially is sterilizing, and he's using uh, propane heat with insulated 55 gallon barrels. I think this is a pretty interesting modular setup 
I still uh, get a little queasy anytime I see fossil fuels or single use plastic put into any production system, but that's not to take away from Brian's uh, farm at all. I think it's absolutely wonderful and that's a very good option. Uh, I use just small all-American autoclaves. I have two 41 quart ones, but this is another option for small scale growers, which can uh, actually can grow quite a bit with just one little one, as we'll see later. Uh, making a culture and a master. And so this is actually not an image of a mushroom farm. This is just a stock image that I used to show an example of how uh, intensely sterile their labs often are. Uh, full body suits, gloves. Actually, it's interesting because he doesn't even have a mask and many people have a face mask. Um, and that's where all of the work done to create spawn, to create cultures. Um, and what I've learned over the years is that's actually not uh, necessary to be all that sterile. I think technique is much more important than having a completely sterile space. Oh, control is really working weird on me. So uh, when you have a uh, a culture and you put it onto a new petri dish it will start to grow uh, in a circle if it is isolated properly and again you can learn a lot from observing it at its vegetative stage and a master is just taking a tiny little square of that petri dish and putting it onto a sterilized bag of often grain or grain and sawdust and then you expand and colonize Again, using Brian Callow as an example, he would pasteurize a enormous amount of these blocks in the unicorn filter patch bags, and then he would stack them up into one of his labs and then do all of the work of inoculating in front of his flow hood, which is really just breaking up a early generation colonized bag and then putting a tiny amount of that material into many more bags. And then colonizing, in this case, happens uh, in racks in this room that you can see in the back. Um, and for many other mushroom farms, it's often just in a controlled climate to be uh, anywhere from 60 to 75 degrees, depending on what they're growing and what their preferences are or season. And then you fruit them. This is most regularly done on racks, again, in heavily controlled environments, all very artificial to maximize yield and consistency, um, which is helpful for yield and consistency, but um, I think there are several other ways to do it. You also can be, uh, in the case of Brian Callow, who's also pretty consistent, he does this in these greenhouses that we mentioned earlier, and uh, that is a very viable option. But all of these are done, rely heavily on these filter patch bags. Um, about one is equated to about a pound when you in input all the, it takes for the spawn creation upstream. And so anytime you're buying a pound of mushrooms uh, in a grocery store or something, you can expect that there is uh, some plastic associated as well as a good portion of fossil fuels. And so I'm attempting to try to just make baby steps away from that paradigm while still respecting all of the intense amount of work and value from those systems. And so the goals that I had with starting a farm are threefold. It's to reduce environmental impact or put more specifically, really maximize beneficial environmental impact which I'm not quite there yet, but also increase accessibility. I think a lot of these things in terms of facilities and uh, laminar flow hoods and all of this expensive equipment um, and really dense literature is very hard to access. And I think that really putting the tiniest bit of information into the hands of the public to allow them to grow their own, I think is really important to make steps forward, really decentralizing uh, some of this and having more people experimenting uh, 
uh, is important. So reduce environmental impact, increase accessibility, and increase medicinal and nutritional value. And that I'm not totally sure on. That's specul speculative at this point um, of whether outdoor grown or indoor grown or wild harvested um, is more or less med medicinal. But uh, in terms of at least vitamin D content, that can be expected to be higher in outdoor grown settings because you're getting the full spectrum of the sun, which converts, um, just like our own skin, converts uh, mushrooms to produce more vitamin D. So I acquire a strain um, from the woods. That's often my first step. I find a good fruiting body, something that uh, is showing traits that I want and the most beneficial um, highest rate of success is when you are cloning. Spore, taking spores is still important to do, but uh, cloning has the highest rate of success from my experience of having a viable strain. This is my lab. <laughs> it's pretty far from being uh, perfectly sterile. There's no um, positive pressure air or sticky mats or, or uh, lab coats. I don't use any gloves or masks or anything. It's largely just paying attention to a few things, mainly uh, that upstream is more sterile and downstream is less sterile. And I uh, do have a pretty nice flow hood, but I've made, grown quite a bit of mushrooms just with a still air box like we saw in those pictures from uh, the dorm room. And so just to kind of illustrate the point of how easy it can be, I have a little video of uh, my current intern, Josh, from Sterling College doing a clone from a wild strain that we took. He just took a tiny little piece of the interior flesh of the fruit body, and he had a sterilized scalpel that he just sterilized with this uh, torch, you see. And then he takes some parafilm and making sure that his movements are slow, his breath is slow, um, he just covers up the uh, petri dish, and that's really all there is to it. As you can see, he knocked over a couple things, maybe a little bit nervous because this was his first time ever. Um, but really, in my experience, starting to cultivate, this was a very mystical realm to be in. Being Doing lab work seemed like I had to have a PhD in mycology in order to do it. And through experience and the help of some mentors, I realized that that's so far from the truth. It's interesting because Laura Spence, who I mentioned earlier on, um, when I was taking fungal ecology from her, she actually would never, we, there was a flow hood in uh, the lab of Sterling College. She would never use it. And she would pour agar dishes and we would do test dishes together because I was pretty baffled by this. Um, and very few of them would contaminate. And it was largely just technique. And so I think that uh, using all of these gloves and all of these masks, it's more of a perceived need and actually a huge waste product that could be saved from our landfills and from flooding our oceans. So uh, Josh was able to complete that task. And then about two weeks later, um, not only was it fully colonized and completely uncontaminated, but you can see a little bit on the top right of the screen that it actually was fruiting in the petri dish, which is a very beneficial sign for having a commercial strain because it shows their eagerness to uh, repro show a reproductive structure. But even if it does get contaminated, there are benefits to that too. Um, I will sometimes even intentionally contaminate a petri dish of a strain that I think has potentially lost its vigor and introducing it to a competitor in my mind allows it to remember what it's like being in the wild. Um, another thing that I do, which is a little hard to tell in this screen, is I will put uh, sawdust or the fruiting substrate that I'm aiming to use with the mushrooms that I'm trying to grow in their petri dishes. So instantly from uh, some of the earliest stages of their cultivation, they're getting used to the food that they're going to have to rely on. It is good to vary their food as well, but it's a balance because you do want them to understand how to use this food um, 
and maximize the nutrition from it. Uh, and when you are gathering a strain, any strain, whether it be wild or commercial, in order to keep a good culture bank, you want to make sure you can preserve it well. Um, I took a note out of, uh, well, a few, out of Radical Mycology by Peter McCoy, one of which has been extremely helpful is his alternative way to, for culture storage. So you see DWA on the bottom right of this petri dish, and that means distilled water agar. So I took a little piece of agar from this king oyster, Pleurotus syringii, and put it on this petri dish. And the petri dish is all distilled water agar, so there's zero nutri nutritive value. And then after that, I autoclaved um, a jar, small jar of distilled water. And then I took several cubes from this petri dish and put it into the distilled water. And so it is suspended with absolutely zero nutrition. And that allows you to potentially um, keep this strain without any loss of vigor for, as Peter says, potentially decades or forever. And he has recovered a strain after several years with no loss in vigor. So that's a very interesting method because that can be done at room temperature without requiring uh, a fridge or freezer be kept on for long periods of time over years. So then you make a master. I have the same picture from my other master. Um, and, and again, that's just taking a small chunk of agar and, and introducing it. Um, I use a mixture of grain and sawdust because I believe that it is best to have a high jump off point, uh, high jump off rate rather, which I see as being more beneficial with grain because they have more nutrition and yet more points of inoculation, which can be more easily achieved with sawdust because there's tinier particles. So after you have your master, in my situation, I will then inoculate using my barrel system. This is a pretty simple device that does most of the work for me. Um, I use this to hydrate my substrate. I use it to mix amendments. I use it to inoculate, and then I use it to uh, pour it into the containers that I'm looking to grow out of. This is just a 55 gallon barrel <clears throat> food grade with a lid and a collar, like you can see to the right. And the uh, structure that it is sitting on um, is just four by fours. It's actually three 10 foot four by fours and two, two by 10 foot two by fours. And <clears throat> towards the back, there's that little, the picture on the left is showing the back of it. And I drilled two nails on either side, which allowed me to put a two by four to raise the back which helped the drain after I cleaned it and also allowed me to put an angle on it so I could pour the substrate that has been inoculated into the containers. So I'm gonna give you the protocol for one batch of mushrooms that I grow. I know uh, many words on a page is normal, normally to be avoided, but I think it would be too difficult for me to simply explain this verbally without giving a visual for you to follow. So I pour roughly half of a 40 pound bag of hardwood fuel pellets <clears throat> into those barrels when they're upright. And then I pour a half pound of both gypsum and lime into that barrel on top of the dry sawdust pellets and then the rest of the pellets. So it's kind of a lasagna method. When you put the gypsum and lime on bottom, it gets stuck somewhere. And if you put it on top, the same problem happens. And so Putting it in the middle is best. And then I add one cup of hydrogen peroxide and one cup of urine from the Rich Earth Institute. The hydrogen peroxide I only use for lion's mane. And it's interesting to note that even though that comes from an industrial process nowadays, uh, the vast majority of organisms do produce hydrogen peroxide, our own livers do. And um, it's something that gets broken apart very quickly just H2O2. So it essentially becomes H2O and uh, oxygen. So water and oxygen in the substrate, which is extremely beneficial for lion's mane for some reason. I've done experiments with many different amendments or uh, treatments for the substrate, but this is one that's particularly beneficial. 
and then the cup of urine may turn some heads, um, but it's important to note that this is pasteurized urine and is legal from the Rich Earth Institute in Brattleboro, Vermont. And this has significantly improved my yields. Only one cup for 40 pounds of uh, fuel pellets and 48 pounds of water is very dilute of both of those things. And yet they make significant changes in your yields and consistency. So after I add those amendments, or rather I add them about the same time as I am putting the water into the barrel, which I use a cheap flow gauge from Home Depot to do so from a hose. And then I flip this barrel full of water and amendments um, once every five minutes for 20 minutes. It's not extremely strict. Um, and often I'll use that time to take notes about uh, lab protocol if I was doing a lab earlier or just get any other work done. And then I add five to 15 pounds of sterile spawn um, and the five pounds is for oysters, the 15 pounds is for lion's mane, and then I flick a handful more times to homogeneously mix all of the ingredients, and then I fill and lid the buckets, and then poke holes in the sawdust, which I'll show you in a second, and stack and label. So I use hardwood fuel pellets um, from Canada right now. I've use Lauzone and Energex were the two main ones that I use. My friend Glenn, who has had a lot of success with this for many years, he uses Logique um, and those are kiln dried. So he, he actually does not use any substrate uh, treatment whatsoever. He just hydrates it with a little bit of gypsum and lime and then adds sterile spawn and then grows absolutely beautiful mushrooms. I have a little bit more trouble potentially because I'm in a mold factory of a basement <laughs> or potentially because I'm using reusable containers that are very difficult to, to clean perfectly. But whatever the uh, reason is, these are still very good. And this is how uh, it looks. This is again my intern Josh, who's just pouring it right into a bucket and you'll see the holes on the side. I use eight holes for a four gallon bucket. And once this is filled, I do not pack it tightly. I just basically fill it a little bit over the brim and then gently pat it to make a flat top surface, pop on the lid, and then put my finger directly into all eight holes, which allows for a little cavity. Um, this does two things. One, it, it makes it so there isn't a kind of dried out crusty exterior point which sometimes can reduce yields or make it so there's less food for the fungus to consume. Um, and it also um, makes it so there isn't sawdust that's pushed into the fruit body. I use four gallon buckets, well, largely because that's what I had available from the waste stream. None of my uh, thousand buckets that I've collected thus far are new. They're all food grade, either from a cut flower farm or from a jam and puree business. An alternative, something that I actually planned on running this whole farm from is wood chips, as Yolanda mentioned. Um, my absolute favorite way for treating any substrate that does have host fungi um, and competitors that may reduce yields or consistency is anaerobic sterilization. I think it should be way more broadly adopted and it is unbelievably simple. Anaerobic sterilization is a complicated word for keep it in water for a while, to make sure it's submerged. Uh, you can use a trash can or 55 gallon barrel, which you can often glean from the waste stream or any other container you have available. It is important to keep a little grate or of some sort on top and keep it all submerged because you want to asphyxiate the current competitors, the aerobic decomposers that are in these uh, substrates. So then when you drain this uh, material, it will have already become fully anaerobic and then draining it will introduce air again, which will kill all of the anaerobes, leaving you a sterilized substrate for no fossil fuel or energy investment. Uh, another thing that I use quite a lot right now is straw. Um, this is an extremely low tech method, but something that I think is not very capitalized on uh, widely because straw buckets are 
unbelievably abundant, um, I mean, unbelievably profitable. Uh, again, all you have to do is submerge them. Both of these containers were free from the waste stream, just cleaned them out heavily, put them some straw in, and I submerged them with uh, some bricks, some uh, concrete bricks that I got from Home Depot. And I will briefly, in a moment, talk about the uh, financial value of doing this. So this is after um, it has sat for two days, that is all it takes for wood chips. Um, people often recommend two weeks. That's what I've heard most commonly. I have success with it at one week. Um, I really, if you can't tell yet, I enjoy to push the boundaries and try to make as many experiments with things that uh, people say won't work just because I like to test the waters. Many of those have not worked, <laughs> but some have. And so I recommend two days of anaerobic soaking for straw and about a week or a week and a half for anaerobic soaking for wood chips. For straw, if you are, actually I'm gonna show this video first just to give you a little visual of uh, just how it's done. We had just soaked that for uh, two days. People are extremely eager to help with this process because it is so easy. Um, and so uh, I've had many people in the community just come by and give a few hours of free labor. The spawn that I use is actually a fruited bucket. So oh, I guess I can't pause that while you still see it. But if you look behind uh, the play button right here, you'll see that this is, it has the date on the top and it has PO, Pleurotus ostreatus as two and a half SDG, which means I inoculated uh, a few bags of hardwood fuel pellets with two and a half uh, bags of sawdust and grain. I used ash in this context to give it a leg up as a chemical pasteurization, but that's not necessary anymore and I don't use it. And it was on Energex with a little bit of gypsum and lime. But the important thing to note here is that I have yielded this bucket a a total of two times and it's gotten three pounds. And now after it has gained almost $40 of income, actually over $40 of income, I am now using it as spawn, um, which is a very simple thing to do um, and has a lot of benefits. So every bucket that I fruit with sawdust can then be grown out seven times, at least that's what I'm doing right now, 7x onto uh, straw buckets and they all I use minimums right now so a minimum of two pounds for all of my strains for I'm mainly just doing uh, several different oyster strains and then uh, mainly just Herisium arenaceus which was it's a Paul Stamets strain and all of them have a minimum of two pounds per uh, bucket in its lifetime. Often they will get two pounds in its first and second flush and I like to flush them <clears throat> at least four times. So having enough containers to be able to go through this whole rotation is extremely helpful because they're not very linear and I'll get to that in a moment. So after they're <clears throat> inoculated, whether it being sawdust or wood chips or straw, I uh, stack them and label them. And so uh, something that I've found to be useful in tight spaces is these little rolling racks. You can get them on Amazon. They're beneficial because they're on casters and they perfectly fit uh, six rows, four high. Um, you could probably get them a little taller, but it gets a little sketchy. And so that saves a lot of room and also allows you to uh, move around your space if you need more. Uh, space for different things. And unlike a bag, you can't watch the whole interaction that is going inside of the bucket. Um, that was something very nerve wracking for me at, in the beginning, but I've learned to trust it. And this is what I'm looking for, a cottony white thick mycelium. It does not start this way, but this is how you know that you're going to get a fruiting soon. It will start as kind of thin wispy mycelium and then uh, grow thicker as time goes by. As you can see on the upper edges um, and the left, there actually is a little bit of contaminated mold. Now, some growers would be really scared of this. Um, I've actually 
learned that it is not a big deal. Um, many times I observe trichoderma, which is the most common contaminant I have, on different parts of my substrate. The thing is that these organisms that we're growing, these oysters and lion's mane, different Pleurotus and Heristium species are all over the place in the wild. And the fact of the matter is they are not perfectly colonizing anything. And in this case, when you are giving them a high leg up, they're not being grown from spores, they're being grown from mycelium. They've already been given food, either sawdust or grain, and you're giving a high rate of inoculation compared to what a spore on the wind can introduce into this bucket or from your hands or your breath when you are uh, filling the buckets. So what happens if they are in the proper conditions that they like is that little contaminant will just try to begin to colonize and they will just get shut down. I've watched this battle many, many times and I've even done side-by-sides with buckets that I put in different temperatures. And through this, I've learned that at least the species that I'm using most commonly right now, Pleurotus ostriatus and Heristium arenaceus, they fight off their competitors best at about 60 to 65 degrees, um, probably 60 being optimal. And I've done side-by-sides with Heristium specifically that were pretty interesting, whereas <clears throat> I put uh, a batch, I did two batches exactly the same at the same time with the same spawn, generation of spawn. And then I put one batch upstairs and one batch downstairs. Um, the batch upstairs was in about 75 degree temperature. The batch downstairs was about 65. And the batch upstairs uh, got about half of them got contaminated to a point where it was not uh, advantageous <laughs> to the farm. And the other half were kind of okay, but still pretty colonized by a competitor. And then the ones downstairs, 100% of them were overcame the competitor fungi. Now, some would argue that that um, is still not beneficial because they're putting resources towards fighting rather than fruiting. And uh, while I agree with that, I'd argue that it is still um, the marginally less yield that you could observe, um, I don't think is worth putting in that amount of fossil fuels to sterilize everything or labor and time. So in terms of uh, the bottom line, I still think it's beneficial. And these are where they fruit. Um, I do this outdoor. This is kind of um, an iteration off of uh, Glenn Coville at Wild Branch Farms method. Um, he did come up with this specific hoop house. I'll tell you what I've iterated on later, but this is very simple and cheap. So going back to that accessibility piece, all we did was take um, one foot rebar that's pushed about two thirds into the ground. It's five feet wide um, on either end. <clears throat> and then you jump five feet to the next uh, place where you input the rebar and so on and so forth. And then we just take a uh, PVC conduit, which doesn't degrade in the sun. And uh, those make the hoops. They're not connected to each other and they still create a very high performing structure. And then on top, this is 70% uh, shade cloth. I highly recommend 80% after uh, <laughs> the past few weeks of really hot and dry summer that I experienced. That was a regret in a small cost change that would have actually saved me quite a bit over time. And then they fruit. Um, just the microclimate that this creates can be very valuable. There's something extremely important to note about this system. It relies on life. It relies on plants transpiring. So this is just very short grass here. And I noticed that I had to water these a bunch of times a day, maybe five, six times a day <clears throat> in order to make this system work. I could have put a sprinkler on, which would have helped the problem, but there are other ways to do it. Um, even though this can work in prime conditions when it's kind of overcast and rains a little bit every day, that would still just work as is, I'm looking for a little bit more consistency. But still, um, this was last year with some of the experiments that I was doing, um, and still even with lion's mane, I got quite a bit of good consistency um, just in the um, last fall because it's perfect temperature and uh, humidity in our climate in the Northeast. 
And so it really doesn't take a whole lot. And as you can see, they come out beautifully. But uh, quality product is really important. I sell all of my oysters for no less than $14 a pound and all of my lines main for no less than 16. That's the wholesale price um, for anything less than a few pounds. It would be uh, 18 and 20 respectively. But something to note, you might be wondering why these are on uh, a porch. And that's because uh, this is a little, I guess, element to be an iron, uh, problem to be ironed out. And so when there is too much rain, right before the mushrooms are reaching maturity, it is important for having the best quality um, to bring them into a dry space where they're not getting continually drenched. Um, my solution to this was I had a little uh, porch right near where I was growing. You can also just put up a little pop tent and just uh, put that over different areas of a grow tent that's, that's fruiting. And really they just need to be out of di direct droplets. I've also toyed around with um, putting uh, polywoven plastic over these shade tunnels. And I don't have enough data to give you uh, more conclusive answers. But if you would like to keep in touch with a lot of the experimentation I'm doing, um, please reach out. Uh, same goes for lion's mane. It's very important, important that they are a little bit young, younger than at least the growers that I've seen. They, their teeth aren't fully, fully formed and they're relatively dry. And these are some of the tools that I use to market to restaurants and uh, as well as the environmental ethics and the uniqueness of this cultivation style, which really has uh, created a huge market just through word of mouth, um, which I think there's something to be learned from even though everyone's context is different. So this is getting back to Glenn. Uh, he's never looking at the camera because I, he told me I had to promise he would never know if I was taking a picture of his farm, though he gave me full permission to take any pictures. Quite a modest individual, but this is his production system. And together we kind of realized how important it is to have uh, the grass in, in these systems. So even though you can kind of just see some turkey tails to the right with cardboard at the bottom, these beautiful oysters were taken out of a bed with abundant grass and they were doing much better than the beds that had cardboard on the bottom because effectively these plants are living humidifiers that supplies the moisture that these mushrooms need to grow properly right where they need it. And so this is uh, one of my fruiting areas. Um, this was actually an area that was, uh, had, was heavily degraded um, because it was an area near the house that needed to be excavated to um, fix some structural issues. And so I was trying to build some soil and kind of stack functions in this space and stack uh, value added or not value added, just products in general. And so uh, just like Yolanda was explaining earlier with wine cap or King Strafaria, um, this system was done mainly with sawdust and straw. So the first, uh, step here was to put down a cover crop for me. I wanted to hold the soil so there wasn't erosion. I also wanted to put some carbon in the soil and potentially some nitrogen fixing bacteria. So I used a couple different types of legumes um, and oats and vetch. And then I put down uh, some spawn with 10 bales of straw and 300 pounds of sawdust that I was able to source locally. Um, and then I covered them all with shade cloth. And so uh, this was early in the season. And once the cover crop grew up, um, it was pretty perfect timing uh, at a certain point for when it started to get drier. That's when the uh, cover crop was getting denser and thus providing more moisture in the hoop houses. But a big problem that I have and I'm still dealing with that I, <laughs> I hope you guys learn from is uh, if you have chickens, contain them. If you're trying to put a cover crop, this is a pretty amateur mistake, but they ravaged certain areas of my cover crop. And so that's kind of still coming back to haunt me because you can just see the stark contrast of totally dehydrated mushrooms on one end of a uh, area that doesn't have a lot of foliage versus the other end where there's 
thriving mushrooms where there's grasses or different cover crops that you're using. Um, this has worked out pretty well with the strafaria. They also, even though it's kind of a larger space than what's just under the shade tunnels that they are colonizing and inhabiting, um, they tend to appreciate the beneficial microclimate that's created by these little structures. And so they fruit in the same space as all the other mushrooms that you're picking. Um, and so that makes it easier in terms of time management. You can just kind of be taking your morning routine to, to gather all your uh, harvest for the day and then also be picking the mushrooms there from the soil up. So it gives you kind of another layer to harvest from. And it's interesting, I didn't think that it would be beneficial to have a bunch of buckets all over uh, a growing mycelial mat on your mulch layer, but it turns out that they actually love it. And so that little area under those buckets colonizes really heavily. Um, and I actually sometimes feel bad when I have to pull a bucket and move it to a different area because I'm exposing all that raw mycelium to the elements. Um, so it's a, a system that works pretty darn well together as long as you're keeping all of the elements intact. And so I wanted to go into a couple nuances because um, if any of you are interested in trying this method, which I very much so hope you are. I hope as many people would like to experiment this on small scale or larger scale and talk to me. Um, not making anyone sign a non-disclosure or non-compete. I would like as many people to get into this so more innovation can occur. Um, it's kind of too much for one person to, to try all these experiments with good notes. And so this is a picture of a lion's mane I harvested this morning. The little Sharpie to, to show for scale. Um, and I just wanted to note some of the inconsistencies in this method because there's been some glorification here of, of what it can do, rightly so in my opinion, but also I want to show some of its shortcomings. Um, here we have a bucket that was inoculated on 624. It's a lion's mane and there was uh, a harvest on 716. So only three weeks after it was inoculated, which is actually about half as long as it normally takes. My average is about six weeks um, for commercial cultivation. It's normally about a month while you get till you get the fruit. Um, in this case, it takes a little longer potentially because of that microbial battle. So I'm pointing this out because often the first yield is the heaviest, but uh, this in my farm, it is not the case. Um, it's actually very varied. So it got 0.8 pounds on 716. And then uh, today, this morning, it got a pound 1.2, which was this cluster that we just saw. And that's a pretty interesting trend that I'm noting, a trend of lack of trends. <laughs> I'm having a lot of difficulty, potentially till winter, to really see uh, a pattern that I can latch onto. And that's okay, I'm just gathering as much data as I can at this point. So I'm gonna show you a few buckets that were all done the same way. On the top, you see the date, 430 HE, which is Hericea marinaceus or lion's mane. After is what it was inoculated with, which is three and a half bags of sawdust and grain. That's what the SDG stands for. It was two uh, cups of hydrogen peroxide. This was per two bags of um, hardwood fuel pellets and then half gypsum and half lime. And so this, uh, mix yielded um, a half a pound over a month after it was inoculated, which was a little disappointing. <laughs> and then after the second yield, it uh, fruited 1.3 pounds, which was surprising, and then back down to a half pound. And so with this uh, project, I'd just like to communicate that if you're estimating how much you'd like to produce for a given market, estimate at its low end. Um, two pounds per bucket, it is, is very profitable still um, with this method because a bag of hardwood fuel pellets is $5.50 where I am. I, I'm realizing now that may not be uh, the case where you are. I know in upstate New York, that's a reasonable price, but uh, one bag can make about five buckets. And so it's roughly a dollar um, for the substrate in that bag. And all you're adding is, is water, a little bit of gypsum and lime and 
hydrogen peroxide. So maybe in total, uh, it's about $2 when you divvy that up. And so even at a minimum of $2 per bucket, um, we're still getting, at least in my case, uh, $32 off of that bucket. So anyway, getting back to the inconsistencies, here you'll see the same exact recipe, but uh, this got 1.1 pounds on its first yield, and then almost two months after it was inoculated, and then 0.63 on its second yield uh, a bit after. Um, and then in this case, a, a different trend. <laughs> it got 0.8 um, almost exactly a month after it was inoculated, 0.7, not too long, a few weeks after, and then 0.8 and then 0.6 respectively. And in total, it is still reaching the goals that I'm looking to get, which is a minimum of two pounds a bucket. Um, but in terms of what you can expect on a weekly harvest, it's important to communicate uncertainty with the people that you work with. I feel very lucky to have the chefs that I have in my area, which was largely a, um, not by mistake, did a lot of market research before I landed here. Um, but restaurants are really beneficial for a bunch of reasons. First of all, they appreciate a high value, high quality product. They're willing to pay top dollar for it. And they're willing to, at least in my case, deal with some flexibility. Um, in, in my case, it's actually increased demand because I explained that this is seasonal and experimental and uh, ethical and really they just can't get enough and they give me their email or their cell phone number and they say just tell me when and they will come to me uh, literally drive to my farm in order to pick up the orders so it's interesting that something that i perceived might be a deal breaker for this farm is actually um, creating some mystique around it so that's another example of inconsistency and then here we'll show kind of the weirdest of the bunch. This was a different uh, mixture. You'll see that I have five ash, that's five cups of ash um, that I was trialing with early on. And you had pretty low yields for the first few and then it finished off with a pound. And so really, I mean, we're still getting yields that are more than um, profitable for the substrate. I right now am projected to uh, be making about 10 to 12 grand um, income or profit off of just this farm this year. Um, this is what I consider my year to be um, simple and, and slow. I call it an MVP. This was a term I believe coined by Eric Rise in the lean startup. Um, and it's basically putting as minimal um, resources into uh, endeavor as it as you can in order to get out uh, a product that then you can bring to market and see, test all of the different hy hypotheses or assumptions you're making uh, when going into that entrepreneurial project. So that's, uh, oh, I think I, yep, okay. So that's really um, how I grow. It's just of utmost importance to me to be continuously moving in this direction of not just sustainability because sustaining the systems that we're putting in place right now is still going to lead to uh, a very difficult climate to live in, um, but regenerating the ecosystems that we're a part of.